All right. I'm handing it off to Dr. Michelle Igo now. I need to unmute. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the presentation from the College of Biological Sciences. As Yasmin mentioned, I am the Associate Dean of Undergraduate Programs in the College of Biological Sciences, and I'm also a professor of microbiology and molecular genetics. The College of Biological Science is unique in many ways, and one of them is we're one of the few biological sciences colleges in the United States. The advantage of being a College of Biological Sciences is that we have faculty members who work on a wide variety of things. We have a, ro a robust and diverse community with 124 faculty members, 15 of whom are National Academy of Science members. We have 175 staff members, and that's not even counting all of the research faculty and research assistants that are associated with our college. The college is divided into five academic departments, evolution ecology, microbiology and molecular genetics, my home department, molecular and cellular biology, neurobiology, physiology and behavior known as NPB, and plant biology. Next slide. One of the things that's the advantage of having a college of biological sciences is that we look at all the things that are needed for life. And what I mean by that is there are people who are working on atoms and molecules. We have people who, for example, are working in nanobiology, looking at how single molecules interact with DNA. We have people working in cells and multicellular organisms. We have people very interested in tissues and organ systems. Organisms, it's amazing how many different organisms people in the college are working on. And finally, we're dealing with populations and community and ecosystems in bio biosphere. Having everybody in the same college allows students and researchers to move between these different levels. Um, next slide or animation. So two of our majors, biochemistry and molecular biology and systems and synthetic biology, are for students who really like to focus on very small things. It's a major where people who are interested in computer science, interested in quantitative biology and chemistry really find a home. Next, the next major is cells. And that would be two departments in particular. My home department is cellular and me uh, medical microbiology, where we look at viruses, bacteria, um, parasites, and things that affect not only the human body, but also other organisms. And cell biology is a major that works more on eukaryotic cells, but exactly how a cell works. Now in next, we have a group of majors. These are the ones that really focus on um, the organism, human biology, which is open by lottery only, um, neurobiology, physiology and behavior, and plant biology. And each of those departments have a specific focus. Genetics tends to go among different organisms and they have a component where they're looking at the DNA. The next group are evolution, ecology and biodiversity major and the marine coastal sciences major. And the advantage of that major is they're looking at ecosystems and how the world works. They're very interested in the impact of climate change on ecosystems and how the planet is evolving. And then finally, we have the biological sciences major, and that's for students who wanna look at all of the different levels and wanna take a little bit of everything. And that's really good for students who are interested in, for example, getting a minor, or are interested in using a biological sciences degree in something like um, government, uh, writing, teaching, et cetera. Next slide. So here's some fun facts about the CBS majors. When we're talking about our majors, the main difference in them, as I said, it's the level at which you think about the problem. Now, it doesn't mean, for example, I work in medical microbiology or microbiology and host interactions. I look at small things and I am interested in how they interact with hosts. 
So I'm looking at a bacteria and I'm also looking at how it interacts with either a human or a plant. But my home is in microbiology. So one of the things we ask students, are you interested more in molecules, cells, organisms, and ecosystems? Do you love chemistry? Do you hate chemistry? Do you love math? Do you not like math? All of these, when you talk to your BASC advisor, can help you figure out the best fit for you. The other thing is why questions. Why does something work in a certain way? It's different from how. And so as you're taking your courses in the early part of your, um, your time at UC Davis, you can kind of figure out what types of questions you like, and then what sort of research problems do you find interesting? And that can also help you figure out what types of things you want to do. And it really doesn't matter the major. A lot of students will find that they are interested, for example, in how climate change affects microbes. They could either ma major in microbiology or in evolution ecology. Next fact. The other thing is, is that a lot of students want to be pre-professionals, pre-med, pre-vet, pre-dent, um, pre-pharmacy, et cetera. And medical schools in particular, since I know a number of you are interested in medical schools, are increasingly interested in students who have a broad outline look. Um, that includes not only the sciences, but also in terms of the humanities. The advantage is, is that any major in CBS, even plant biology, can be used as a pre-med major. So you go with what you like and what you love. And to find out more, you can always visit the Health Professions Advising website, which has a close association with the college. And um, you can see the um, URL right there. And then finally, all CBS majors have the same preparatory work for the first two years. Introductory biology, chemistry, organic chemistry, calculus, and physics. The advantage of that is, as a result, you can take the time when you're taking introductory biology and beginning to think about science and what you want to do with it. And you can change majors fairly quickly and still graduate in four years. It's one of the powers of our um, of the program that we've set up. You can also take some courses to help you figure out, you know what types of things you're interested in. But the fact that you are all of our majors have the same core prep is real, really beneficial if you're interested in really exploring different fields of microbio oh, sorry, of biology. Next slide. So we know students worked hard to get here in CBS and we want you guys to succeed. And what we have found is that the passion for a particular field is what carries you through the difficult times. A lot of times students will come in and say, I'm a biochemistry major because I think it's gonna help me get in med school. If you don't love it, it's not gonna help you because your grades are gonna be poor. And when you're talking about it, it's not, you're not gonna be passionate about it. So the right major is the one you are gladly spending time studying. Uh, UC Davis is also on the quarter system and it's important to recognize that you need a lot of study time. And for students who are coming in from high school or other, uh, other um, institutions with a, a semester system, you have a lot of time to recover. At UC Davis, classes last for 10 weeks and they move fast. And the rule of thumb is for every hour or every unit, you can expect two to three hours of outside class time. And for students entering as freshmen in particular, one of the challenges of, of the fall quarter is really understanding this rule and the importance of taking the time to study. And then finally, there's a quote. Don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go do it. Because the world needs is people who have come alive. Next slide. So we have a number of different things to help our students succeed, particularly um, working with incoming students. One is our peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program through the BioLaunch Mentor Collective. 
Each student has the opportunity to work with a continuing CBS student who can help them and answer them questions on everything about where's the best place to eat or what courses to take or how to get help on campus. We also have a one unit seminar for incoming freshmen and a separate one for incoming um, transfer students. Over the summer, you're getting tons of information thrown at you. The bio launch seminar helps slow it down. So for example, you've learned how to register for classes. Well, right before registration for winter quarter, one of the basket advisors comes in and reviews what exactly you need to do. We also bring in the pre-health professions people. We bring in faculty to talk about how to get in research, et cetera. But your most important resource is the Biological Academic Success Center. Next slide. So this is our peer mentoring program. And um, you can see this video on YouTube. Um, the way it works is, is that you work through a student plat a platform that's run by a company. So students can use the platform so you never have to exchange any personal information. But a lot of our students actually get together and they can become friends or at least have someone the first day of campus meet you and help you find your rooms. Next slide. The seminars I've already mentioned. Um, and one of the things I would like to say, it's a one unit class. It's open only to incoming CBS students. We expect everyone to receive a passing grade. I highly encourage you to um, take it. It's one unit once a week and you get to meet a lot of students in your class, but also faculty who are stopping by just to talk to you. So these seminars are where campus resources come to you, rather you try to find them. Next slide. And so finally, I just want to leave with some of the uh, accomplishments of students who come to UC Davis and their accomplishments. The college is committed to ensure every CBS student gains va valuable hands-on experience in the classroom, the lab, the field, through internships, following doctors, um, if that's your interest, or vets. Um, we also have links to study abroad. Uh, for example, I teach introductory bio in Ireland each year, and we do have a number of study abroad programs that allow students to take a course abroad, and it fits into your um, schedule so that you can graduate in the time period. So 32% 32 32 of our students have internships and field experiences, 58% complete a research project or paper, 64% of our transfer students graduate in two years and 68% of our freshmen in four years. And we're very happy with those accomplishments. We'd like it to be higher, but it's the best on the UC Davis campus. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Yasmin. Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Jasmine Campos. I am the Associate Director of the Biology Academic Success Center, which Dr. Iko has already mentioned is that one-stop shop for all students to receive um, advising services in the College of Biological Sciences. And so what you're looking at on this slide is a screen grab from one of our websites. And if you haven't taken the opportunity already to look through the BASC website, I highly encourage you to do so. And you see there's some blue links up at the top of, of that um, slide right there. This is a very good opportunity if you have your phone or a way to screen grab those two links, they're going to be very important. That first part is CBS undergrads at ucdavis.edu. And that is actually the BASC's email address. Um, and so when you send an email through that email address, it gets routed directly to our front desk advisor who sends it out to the appropriate advisor um, and tries to answer questions as best as she can. And she is very good at answering questions. So feel free to send those in. And then that second link right there is the BASC website. Um, so it has academic sam our sample academic plans for you, our majors and minors, and um, a lot of information on how to connect directly with our BASC advisors. 
All right. Looking at the different ways you can connect with a Basque Advisor, we have two different options for you. And the first is going to be those scheduled appointments that are about 30 minutes in length. And those appointments are usually reserved for topics that might um, need a little bit more time to dig into, things like long-term academic planning or trying to get your holds removed from mandatory advising, or um, if you're experiencing any academic difficulties, this would be um, the primary format that you would meet with a Basque advisor. And we host those appointments in three different types of modalities. So you can sign up for an in-person appointment if you'd like, or a phone or a Zoom appointment. So you may have already connected with a Basque advisor to fulfill that Aggie advising requirement, um, but all of that information is going to be on that Basque website on how to book those types of appointments. The second type of appointment, which you'll be eligible to try and like get into is called express advising. And I did just call it an appointment, but I'm going to back up a little bit and say that this is actually our drop-in services. So every week we host regular express advising hours where you can virtually connect with a Basque advisor. So the way it works, you sign up to be added into the queue and then the advisors uh, for your major would be able to see that you're signed in. They send you a Zoom link and you're able to connect with them directly. And this specific type of advising service uh, focuses on like topics that are quick questions, right? I want to change this class out for something. I want to see if this class counts for GE. So all of those small questions that you have where you might not want to take a full 30 minutes to answer, express advising is going to be the best way to address those. Um, and so for now, you won't be able to do that. But once the fall quarter starts, feel free to come into express advising. We're always really excited to see students that way. All right, in addition to the Basque staff advisors, we also have some other folks that work within our center that serve students in different ways. Um, and we have our faculty advisors as part of that system. And we have a faculty advisor for each of the CBS majors, and they have a lot of knowledge and areas of expertise surrounding research and graduate programs that might be involved with your major. So whereas a staff advisor might not exactly know about the best research opportunities that are um, available, those faculty advisors work directly with the Basque advisors um, to, to make sure that you have all the information that you need to make good decisions about research and internships and all those fun sorts of things. We also have three peer advisors who are amazing. They really help uh, students understand the student experience and they're highly trained on GEs and how to schedule classes. And they host in-person drop-in hours for students. So once the quarter starts, feel free to come in and say hi to them. They're all heavily involved with the student clinics on campus. Um, and one of them I think works specifically with migrant farm workers, helping them receive healthcare services. So they are very much in touch with the different opportunities for student run clubs and those sorts of things. And last but not least, we have Megan Brown, who is our embedded counselor in the college. Um, and she works with the Basque. She, her office is actually right near our director's office in the hallway. And she's kind of a direct line to all of those mental health services. So um, we refer students a lot to visit her. She's very good with students, very warm and welcoming. And she really helps um, with a lot of struggles that our CBS students might be facing, um, especially as they transition into their first quarter. It can be a little nerve wracking. So she does a really great job of helping students that way. So if you have any questions about Megan, feel free to let us know and we can always connect you with her. Okay, so this slide is pretty important. It talks a little bit about FERPA. And as, as I know, we have a couple of parents in the room and you might have questions about your student's academic record or how well they're doing. And in the spirit of being helpful, you might reach out to us to try and ask questions. Well, we do have a federal policy in place called the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And that essentially says that once a student enters a post-secondary institution, um, their information, their academic information is going to be federally protected, right? So if you call and you might have questions about that sort of thing, I legally cannot <laughs> answer questions unless if we have a sort of waiver on file or any sort of express permission. 
Now that's not a problem usually until they actually are registered for those courses. Um, so I've had some students and their parents do Aggie advising with me and that's totally fine for right now. But once that switch happens, just know that if you call with questions, um, we would not be able to answer those at that time. And if you have any questions about the FERPA, um, feel free to drop those in the Q&A box and we'll see if we can get to them. Okay, here are some of the campus partners that we are very tied to. We have our success coaching and learning strategies department. They work a lot with helping students build those soft skills that they'll need for all of their classes, not just their, their major requirements. So if they have questions about time management or test taking, they're very good at kind of working on those metacognitive skills, right? Like how well am I really doing and building those sorts of things. Now, if you're looking for content-based help, that would be the Academic Assistance and Tutoring Center. And they work a lot with individual tutorings for those subjects that students tend to struggle in our calculus classes, our general chemistry classes, our organic chemistry classes. This is a very good uh, resource for students. And in addition to tutoring, they also offer co-classes, which are one unit courses that help with supplemental instruction. They reinforce a lot of the content for um, those students that are like taking these heavy classes. So that's another very great resource to check out there. We also have uh, strong partnerships with our health professions advising. Um, as Dr. Igo mentioned earlier, we have um, the Health Professions Advising is actually a part of the College of Biological Sciences, but they actually have a different purpose than the Biology Academic Success Center. Our Biology Academic Success Center, our main job is to make sure that you have everything that you need to graduate, right? So making sure that you're meeting all those GE requirements, making sure that you are meeting your major requirements, your university requirements. So that is our primary job as the BAS Advisors. However, the health professions advising, they really focus on everything that you need to enter a professional or medical type school, right? So they have a lot more resources about the GRE, the MCAT, how to write a personal statement, right? And how to um, align some of those prerequisites to what you're already taking. So they have a lot of expertise. And although we are closely working with health professions advising, we are separate, right? So just make sure that you know that we're the official place that you can get information on your major and all those sorts of things. But when it comes to graduate professional school, definitely health professions advising is awesome for that. We also have that undergraduate research center and they provide students with a lot of opportunities to be able to present and create their own research. So if you're interested in any of those sorts of things, um, you can go ahead and check them out too. All right, we're getting into registration. So at this point in the summer, we've already concluded task one for incoming first year students. Um, at this point, too, for the next week, we're going to be starting past one for transfer students. So during that time, transfer students will be able to enroll in courses that are reserved for them specifically. Um, and we're going to have some express advising available for those students to be able to ask any sort of registration questions. On August 17th, we're going to start a period that is called open registration. So all incoming students, including first year students and transfer students, those folks are going to be able to adjust their schedule during this period of time. So if there is something that you didn't get during pass one, but you want to try it again, or you need to adjust your schedule in any sort of way, that is going to be a period of time that you can go ahead and go in and change things around. Starting August 21st, pass two opens for all students. So this is going to include the continuing students that the students that are already attending UC Davis that are not incoming. And then we'll go into open registration for all students. So that would mean incoming and continuing students would be able to adjust their schedule. And then starting September 20th, we have schedule adjustment for all students. So I always like to say registration doesn't just start when your first registration appointment opens, right? It is a continuous process. So while you might not get all the classes you want first try, there's definitely tons of opportunities to try and get more classes later and add them, right? So we have that for you all. And once we conclude registration, we go straight into our orientation week and we have it split up by transfers and first year students for the purposes of this slideshow, um, just for the dates so you have them accurate. But there are three types of college related programming that I'm gonna go through that's part of this slide. 
The first is our CBS welcome. So it'll be a college-wide welcome, kind of similar to this probably be outside in the courtyard and you'll have a chance to get to see all of us in person and not in little Zoom boxes, right? So that'll be really fun for you to get to meet us. Um, we also have our major advising. So we're going to be having faculty and your best major advisors that you get to interact with. We like to uh, make it a lot more about experiential learning, those sorts of things. So try to make it a little more fun after you've had to endure registration. And then last, we have our campus partners programming. And during this period of time, we'll have health professions advising available and Global Learning Hub available to talk about some of those opportunities that you have um, to either study abroad or to um, start getting some advice on the, the preparation for medical or professional schools. So with all of that information, and I know I just threw a ton of, of information at you at a very short period of time, what we're gonna do is go into some frequently asked questions that our students um, usually have during webinars like this. And I'm actually gonna hand it off to my colleague, the esteemed Dr. Jefferson, to be able to lead us through some of these frequently asked questions. <laughs> All right, so let's just jump right in. You wanna go ahead and go here, there we go. Um, well, I think this one is, Michelle might wanna talk about the research opportunities. I'll let Michelle, Dr. Michelle Igo, give her spew about research because she has more experience than me. <laughs> okay, so a lot of times students want to, are real excited about getting involved in research and internships when they arrive on campus in their fall quarter. And what we recommend is taking a moment just to adjust to life at UC Davis. Focus on your courses. You know, um, I like to think of it as your first quarter is almost like a separate class. By the time you find out the resources and all the other things, you've been really in adjusting to your classes. You really have no time to focus and give attention as you need to a research internship. In addition, during the bio launch seminar, BIS 005 and BIS 198, we'll talk about how to get involved in research and internships because different faculty and different companies or um, community groups have different requirements. Some require um, you to be, you know, have already taken organic chemistry or statistics or something like that. Some of them will let you come in fairly early. You're attending the seminar will help that. I'm going to let Michelle answer this one as well. <laughs> okay. What career opportunities can a CBS major expect and how should a student prepare? What I would say is that science in general is becoming much more interdisciplinary. And if you're interested in the life sciences, you can have lots of different career opportunities. There's things like medicine and pre professional programs, but there's also ones that bridge two different colleges. So for example, there are students who are working in biodesign or students who are working in astrophysics and other kinds of things. And what I would say is during your first two years, take full advantage of the flexibility of our major. And I know that sounds kind of funny, but you're taking these standard courses with everybody else, but during that time, you can explore different fields and come up with what you're passionate about and find out the student clubs that can help you, um, that might be involved, like entrepreneurial work, et cetera. So basically, I'd say a CBS major gives you the basic training you need in problem solving and thinking, experiential learning, and learning to communicate with others. And your career possibilities are endless. We definitely cannot predict the careers of the future, but we can prepare you to take those on. Okay, so where can students find resources to learn about degree requirements and planning courses? You can find that on the BASC website. We have all of our majors listed on the BASC website. We have all of the um, 
the links to our catalog that gives you a, an in-depth breakdown of what's required for each major. And if you wanna talk about, if they wanna see about course planning, we do have four-year sample plans for incoming first-year students. We also have two-year sample plans for incoming transfer students. And if they wanna learn about this in person, the best place to come to obviously is BASC and talk to an academic advisor. But I know that sometimes students wanna see it in writing, have it somewhere saved on their computer. So they can, they can definitely look it up on the BASC website and come in and talk to us about it after they see it and have more questions that they need answered. And during the summer, you can definitely use your Aggie Advising Canvas modules to help. Yes. <laughs> okay, how easy is it to change majors within the College of Biological Sciences? And what does that process look like? It is easy to change your major within CBS. You can change your major in your second quarter, which for incoming first year students will be winter of 2024. Um, if they meet the requirements, which is usually have a 2.0 GPA in your major coursework, be in good academic standing, and also have a 2.0 GPA overall. So if your first quarter you don't take any major classes for your new major or your current major in the C in CBS, you wouldn't be able to change your major in winter because you have to have a 2.0 in major coursework. So you want to make they want to make sure that at least they're at least one of their classes in the fall is a major course. So we can see that they have a GPA already and they can change in winter. It's not a big deal if they have to wait till spring of 2024 to change or fall of 2024. I just know that some students get anxious and they wanna change as soon as possible. Um, I know I don't, I'm not the only one who has advice, but um, <laughs> what advice do you have for students and their family members to support a smooth transition for all? I think for the students, it's about communication. They need to communicate with their parents about what they want their parents to know. A few, a few of the questions were about how do I as a parent get access to my students' academic information? Well, the best way for you to be able to do that is to talk to your student about it, have them sign a purple release and go from there. We just can't bypass your student and give it to you. So the number one thing that I would say is sometimes students don't communicate very well with their parents about what's going on. So the, the lines of communication have to be open in order for there to be a smooth transition. And also my advice for the students is to not overdo it. I see a lot of students who come in from high school who it's awesome. They did really well in high school, but they try to come here and take as many classes and do as much work as they were doing in their senior year, not realizing that this is the university level. We're on a quarter system. They're in a new city most of the time. It's going to be a big change. So they should try to come in and not overwhelm themselves and give themselves, give themselves grace because it's a learning curve. And that's my advice. <laughs> I think for me, it's um, it's not a marathon or it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, right? So I see tons of students trying to add three or four STEM classes their first quarter, whether they're a transfer or an incoming first year student. And that is just not the way to be successful. You want to set yourself up for success when you're registering for classes. So definitely take into account it's 10 weeks. Um, and especially if you're coming from the semester system when it's 15 weeks, you think about how many classes that'll end up being, that's like 12 STEM classes. Maybe, maybe just work on time management, on structuring your time so that you can do very well in these classes. And I'm sure many professional schools will thank you in the process. Dr. Igo, do you have any advice? Oops, you're muted. I actually teach intro bio. So I teach uh, BIS 2A, which is usually students take in the winter and spring quarter. And it's a five unit class and it is really intense. We have our first exam in the third week and some students are just settling down. So to make the transition smooth, that's why we have things like the mentor collective, the peer mentoring, why we have the bio launch seminar. What, what I kind of advise students to do is take two STEM classes and then take something fun, you know, so that you can explore UC Davis, our GEs and our humanities courses. There's so many things that you could explore. And like Jasmine was saying earlier, the majors of the future and the careers of the future don't exist right now, you know? And so you can, by exploring various options, come up with something that's super exciting 
that nobody else has done before. Give yourself the grace in the freshman year, particularly in the first quarter, to take some time and think about it. You're at a brand new place. You've got different faculty members you can go talk to at their office hours, et cetera. And it's a time to explore. That makes a smooth transition. If, you're, if your schedule is packed, if anything goes wrong, you're gonna run into problems. So give yourself some time. It's a gift to yourself. All right, so from here, we're gonna move into um, looking in the Q&A box. Um, but just before we get there, here's a slide that just shows uh, the college website and our different social media platforms. So let me just go straight into that Q&A and then we're gonna go off of um, the questions that we see in our Q&A box. And it looks like we have about 20 minutes before we start that. Um, so the first question I see in the box, um, during open registration week, are students allowed to enroll in courses with only reserved seats available? Or is that only during past two? Um, on the topic of reserved seating, this caused a lot of confusion for our students during past one of incoming first year orientation or registration. Um, so just make sure um, that when you're trying to enroll for courses that have reserved seats available, um, it doesn't always show how many seats are available for the students that are in our college. So it might say that you're uneligible to enroll. Uh, in that case, definitely pick an alternative course. Um, does anybody else have anything about registration or open registration and how they can use it? Efficient. Jasmine, I'll dismiss the like, I mean, uh, like we'll remove the questions once you answer them so we can kind of see how mm -hmm. we're getting the questions. Awesome. Oh, did you already remove that one? Okay, you got it. <laughs> okay, the next one I see is are students allowed to give access to my bill online portal to parents? When it comes to us, we have to get FERPA releases to give you all any type of information about the student. That's all we can really say about the students, uh, you know, personal information. This is type. This is a type of question that you would want to talk to your student about. We we're just we can only speak to what we can give you, and we can only give talk to you about academics because BASC is an, is for academics. We don't really fall into the category of my bill. By when does a student need to decide on pre med? I've known some students who came right in as first year knew they wanted to start, and then some students will decide in their junior year. So it's really dependent upon the student. I will be honest, in the College of Biological Sciences, they're going to meet a lot of the prerequisites for med school just by being in our college. So sometimes students decide late, sometimes they start, they decide early. It's really up to the student when they decide. The, the earlier, the better, of course, but sometimes you just don't know as a first and second year what you want to do, and that's okay. We have a question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I was just answering them from top to bottom. You want to go? No, you go ahead. Is it possible to take classes in other colleges? Yes, only in the summertime, unless it's a class that UC Davis does not offer, then it will be called sim simultaneous enrollment. If it's like, um, I feel like it's a medical assistant program that students at, like we don't have classes at UC Davis for a medical assistant, for example. So if a student wants to take a class at a community college or another university for a medical assistant program, I, and they send me a class that we don't offer at UC Davis, then it would be possible for them to take that class at another institution during the fall, winter, and spring. However, if they just wanna get a head start on taking physics at a community college in the fall, then we're gonna deny that simultaneous enrollment. However, in the summer, students can take classes wherever they want for whatever classes that they want. The, the summer is not a traditional quarter, so we don't hold students to that during the summertime. Um, we will have mandatory advising in the fall. First year students will not have any more appointments for the rest of the summer. So that means towards the end of September, they will be able to start making those 30 minute appointments, but we will have mandatory advising for them.
<laughs> so we won't go into GEs <laughs> where I see that there's like an in-depth question about how to fulfill the GE requirements. We, we do go over GE requirements and mandatory advising pretty in-depth. We didn't really, a lot of people don't have enough time to go into it in depth in Aggie advising because we do have somewhat of a complex GE chart. Mm -hmm. So don't worry, we'll make sure that they understand how to fulfill that GE chart successfully by the time they graduate. If you're looking for a list of GE classes to take on the new student page, um, which I think I've plastered in a couple of emails and on the Aggie Advising Canvas shell, but if not, Google it. Um, at the bottom of the page, you'll see lower division GE courses and upper division GE courses. Depending on whether or not you're a first year or a transfer student, you'll, you can look through that list. Um, and basically it's a filtered out list of all the GE courses, except for the science and engineering courses just because we cover a lot of that through the major classes that we have. If the student doesn't get the course that they require or want, what can the student do? I've We usually give students backup classes in the Aggie advising course um, and the, the on their Canvas, it gives a list of alternate courses that they can choose from. When all else fails, if everything that they're trying to take for their major, if that happens some some way that they're they're full, they can always take GEs, they can always take some electives. The most important thing for a student's first quarter is that they get into 12 units because you definitely need to be full time for a lot of the different programs on campus and housing and stuff like that. So it's just really important to be in 12 units at the end of their first quarter. I mean, at the, by the beginning of their first quarter. And all classes are different sizes, but I will tell you the very popular courses like chemistry and biology and organic chemistry, they're going to be very big classes. And Dr. Michelle Igo can speak to that and I'll let her give, give her how she knows about all of that. <laughs> yeah, so our um, for incoming freshmen, the classes in chemistry, math, and biology mm -hmm. are very big. Some of them are as big as 500 students. That said, we also have labs associated with it or discussion sections that are broken down into groups of 24. In addition, the faculty members all have office hours where students can meet one-on-one -on -one with the faculty member or in small groups. We encourage students to form study groups so they can come in as a group. So as students take their humanities classes or their GE classes, some of those are very big, like uh, Nutrition 10 is a very popular course, and some of them are quite small. Um, so it's a, it's a mix. And some students will find that they really like the bigger classes and some will like the smaller. It's kind of up to the student. In terms of study abroad opportunities, um, what we have is over the years, we've worked out um, four-year plans and two-year plans for students who want to take CBS courses in, through study abroad. And, um, Talk to your BASC advisor about that um, because they can help you find it. So, for example, some of our core courses like um, Intro Bio, um, bis a is taught in Ireland. Intro Microbiology is taught in Belgium. Uh, some of the BIS core, the 100 series, is taught in Japan and other places. So there's a lot of even CBS STEM courses that can be taken abroad. Um, how do students apply, qualify for the honors program for those who did not already enter, get or get selected for it? Well, they will reach out to students who are high achieving students in their first academic year sometime, I believe, in the winter quarter of 2024 a midwinter quarter. And so there will be a, students will have the ability to join UHP once they start their first academic year. It's just a matter of them being invited to uh, apply during the winter quarter. So again, it, it is by invitation. So just tell what tell your student that they want to be on the lookout for getting invited. So the next two questions. I was also, are... I was also going to say that uh, they also have uh, information sessions for the honors program. Right. So th we have two questions about reserved seating and how registration works for that. Um, so what I will say is that. During pass two, every seat that has not been taken that is reserved will open up, right? Um, so 
as Yasmin was saying before, we highly recommend that you enroll in classes. That's the number one priority. So just continue to check and monitor the seats, um, try your best. Um, and if not, please connect with a BASC advisor so we can kind of make an alternative plan there. Okay, what happens if it's, oh, oh, you already got it. Would you recommend in the first quarter that a student take two STEM classes in English or something else? Um, that's a very typical schedule for first quarter, two STEM classes, English and Biz 5. That should get them to the number of units that they need for their first quarter. So by pass two, will you know if you successfully got off the wait list? Not necessarily. Um, you Some students don't know until two weeks into the quarter. And that's why it's important for students to already have 12 units on their academic, on their schedule, because let's say a student is on the wait list and the fall quarter starts and they're in that class waiting for a week. And all of a sudden it's like, yeah, you're not getting off of the wait list and they're only in eight units. Now they have to scramble a week into the quarter to add a class. That's why it's so important to have 12 units that they're actually registered in and have other classes on the wait list because there's no way for us to tell you for sure you're gonna get off of the wait list. So I see it's another question about GEs. Yes, students can take GEs at other colleges in the summer. I see a question from Michelle. <laughs> Next I forgot, the, the, I forgot the, the, what is it? The, um, Carne the Carnegie rule? <laughs> Carnegie units. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, for students who are participating in undergraduate research positions in faculty members' labs and a lot of internships, the students take what's called 99 or 199 credit. So they take one unit and you're expected to do three hours of work for that one unit. Um, and for most students, as I said, we tend to not recommend the first quarter but a lot of students will take for two, two units of um, undergraduate research. The, depending on when you start, the undergraduate research position can be fairly um, simple tasks, but at the end, many of our students are actually doing real research and um, publishing papers. Um, you know, the, in terms of getting a part-time job, once again, uh, it, particularly in the first quarter, it's taking enough time to make sure you can um, study for your classes. The most important thing is to do well in your classes your first quarter, because that just sets you up really well for going forward. And so some students have a part-time job with work study, but if you're trying to do research, that would be too much. So when is the last possible quarter slash year that, that a student can change their major? Well, I've had students change their major fairly late, but I will be honest, the later you do it, the more difficult it is to be able to graduate in the amount of time that they, that they would like to. So I don't recommend changing their major anywhere past their junior year. I feel like once you're in your senior year, you kind of want to buckle down. However, if you get into, they some students get into situations where they can't, graduate from their major successfully. So they have to change majors. They just need to be ready to have to take maybe an extra quarter, two quarters, or even an extra year. As long as they can graduate within the unit cap, it's okay. So they can change their majors late. They can even change their major in their senior year. I just don't recommend it if they don't have to. Can you participate in a minor that's in another college? Yes, absolutely. I actually tell students to try to be diverse with their with their minors because you know majoring in biological science well majoring in MPB and trying to minor in biological sciences just doesn't make a lot of sense to me because they're so similar so it's you know unless it's something that I I can see why a student wants to major in something sim minor in something similar it's actually really good to have a minor that is different from your major because it shows your versatility if you are looking to go into maybe a PhD 
uh, program, med school, nursing school. I have some students who will major in MPD and minor in Spanish because they plan on going somewhere where there is going to be a Spanish speaking population. So they show that not only am I can I go and work in the, the medical field, but I also know Spanish, which is the language of the citizens of the country that I'm going to. So that's a that's a good major and a minor to put together sometimes. And I would say that a lot of students um, are focused on getting a minor because they think it's going to help them get into graduate programs or pre-med programs and other things. And a minor kind of restricts what you can take um, because you got to fill the requirements of the major and the minor. And as we said from the beginning, um, the careers of the future need skills that we haven't put together yet. And so um, if you're putting it together because you're really passionate about like a foreign language like Spanish, go for it. But if you're doing it based on perception that that's gonna somehow do something in terms of your career and you're not really passionate about the minor, I recommend just taking courses instead. We have a question about being able to make an appointment with a basket advisor. Um, if you are experiencing any difficulties trying to get an appointment with a basket advisor, feel free to email the CBS undergrads email address that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we did open up Aggie Advising for first year students back in June. Um, and since then, as you get closer to registration, all of those appointments start to book up and we are unfortunately limited by the number of staff that we have. Um, but for that reason, we have an extensive Aggie Advising Canvas shell, so make sure that your student is looking through all of those folders and requirements, um, and particularly in the announcements, you'll be able to find videos on how to put together a first quarter schedule. So yeah, if you have any more questions on that, feel free to email us there. Okay, if a student does not yet know what classes will transfer in and we're unable to schedule an advising session, what classes are suggested. When I speak with students who have, who said that, who, I mean, sometimes your academic uh, classes that you took at a different school, sometimes they won't show up on your academic record until the end of fall quarter, even if we do get them early sometimes just because of the sheer number of transcripts that admissions is that they're going through, they won't be able to get to all of them at the very beginning of the quarter. So I have told students, just do not take any classes that you think you've already taken. If you can't find it on assist.org because you took it at a community college and you're unsure, just make sure that you're not taking a class that sounds even familiar to something that you took at another institution. Um, you know, psych one and social one, those are gonna be fairly easy to pinpoint, but something like economics of the underclass and sociology, that might have a different title at UC Davis, but we might have it. I only say that because I took it from a class in undergrad for that, but we might have that class um, at UC Davis. It might just be under a different discipline with a completely different title. So the best thing to do is just stay away from classes that you even think you took and wait until the end of fall quarter when your academic record completely updates. All right, I'm keeping an eye on the, the time here. We have one more minute left. So we're gonna finish up the next uh, question and then we're probably gonna wrap things up, um, but we will go ahead and post this recording afterwards. And the last question I see that has been queued up first is, what can a pre-med student expect regarding MCAT prep support? And that is a fantastic question, but it's a fantastic question for health professions advising. So just make sure that you are reaching out to them there. Okay. And with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and thank my co-presenters. Thank you, Dr. Igo. Thank you, Dr. Jefferson. And we will be ending our webinar. So we'll see you Thanks in the Thanks, everyone. Bye.